thrilled that we have Neil Karen with us. Uh, Neil's an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology um, and generally does content, uh, quantitative analysis of social movements, social protests, contentious action, uh, etc. cetera. Um, Neil is one of the first people who I connected with here in my first year. Um, I don't really remember why, I just thought your research was cool. Um, and it is, so I'm excited <laughs> to hear from him. Um, so Neil, in addition to a lot of other things, has an interest in methods around big data. Uh, and actually, I just found this earlier, does all sorts of tutorials on his website uh, around working with big data. Um, and uh, uh, he provides that out to the public as a public game. He's also produced, uh, authored or co-authored uh, 14 peer-reviewed journal articles in sociology, I counted them. You did? Uh, I did, I did. Um, lots of really wonderful work on movements, uh, on, on media, and particularly thinking about how movements are using the web to do things like organize. Um, and I think he's made uh, both contributions to sociology and communication research. Um, I see Neil's name in our discipline often uh, among people who are doing uh, work thinking about how the internet supports collective action, what sorts of collective action, uh, and who's doing it. Um, and Neil also teaches classes in social movements, justice more generally, et cetera. So with that, I will let Neil speak for himself, but thank you. Great, yeah, thanks. So I, uh, right in general, I study the area of social movements and protest, which is a huge, huge, big, large field in the world of sociology. It is sort of one of the things we study, um, like education or the criminal justice system. These are uh, social movements is one of the major uh, f uh, areas of our focus as a field. Um, and so my areas of research um, uh, is on the intersection of the media and social movements and social and particularly uh, and also social movements outcomes so when do social movements make a difference um, and so looked at both how movements use Facebook or Twitter um, and this one will be looking at representations of uh, or yeah representations of movements in the media um, and so this is a um, ongoing project that I'm working on, um, so feedback is greatly appreciated. So there's, there's no paper here, there is just data and some slides. Um, oh, and a website, which I'll get to later, but uh, there's a website for the talk. Um, so the overall sort of theoretical puzzle that I'm wondering or uh, engaging in is how much influence do social movements have? Um, and this is one of the major ongoing debates in sociology today. Um, sort of historically, we've looked at when do social movements come about? Um, what do they look like? The sort of current trendy thing is to look at um, how much influence social movements have. Um, and, so his, and so when we think about this, traditionally we'd look at things like movement characteristics. What are movements doing? Um, are they uh, do they, are they bringing together lots of people in a contentious way? And so here's a photo from uh, Madison, Wisconsin uh, occupation. Um, sort of what kind of frames are they using? How are they presenting their claims? Uh, are they made up, is it a coalition of organizations or is it sort of individuals coming together? Um, what sort of resources does the movement have? Um, so this is one way to think about, in, and how much impact um, does that have? And in general, sort of the more the better. Um, a second strand of things looks at the state and political um, characteristics that movements engage, that, um, uh, that provide the institutional context for movements. Right, and so are you more likely, is a movement for uh, the environment, like to clean up the environment? Um, is Greenpeace more likely to succeed when there's a Democratic president or a Republican president? You know, uh, it's a Democratic president, which is sort of potentially not surprising, uh, but for a lot, but you know, it counts as a finding in social movements. Um, other people would say, uh, uh, more recently looked at, you know, the fact that there are, is for some movements, sort of specific state agencies. And so, for example, the, in 1970, um, largely as a result of the in activism among environmental movement, right, the EPA was founded and later became um, a cabinet level uh, area. And so this creates a, a whole area of the state um, that's about you know, environmental movement, creating sort of bureaucrats, creating funding streams, um, which is good for, uh, in general, the environmental movement. And so we would expect the environmental movement to be stronger now that it has, you know, post-1970 uh, than it was pre-1970. Um, a third factor that people look at is public opinion. 
right? To what extent do movements chi shift public opinion? To what extent are movements shifted by public opinion? Here's just public opinion on abortion over the last 30 years uh, using Gallup data or 40 years, um, right? So to, there is a, uh, uh, some who would hold that sort of social movements and protests um, don't really work. Uh, or to the extent that they work, they only work because you raise public concern about an issue and then Democratic legislators um, sort of get a sense of what their uh, constituents want um, and react to that public opinion. And so, uh, right, to what extent does public opinion matter? Um, and finally, uh, uh, it matters, people look at, well, movements are influential for what? Um, well, what do they, they could be influential for, um, how often do you have hearings? Right, and so here's, uh, uh, well, it says it, Sandra Fluke um, at a congressional hearing, right? How about passage of a bill? How about passage of um, actually getting legislation signed? And then later on, sort of how are policies implemented? And in general, sort of findings in the field are social movements are fairly influential in having hearings. That is, does con Congress pay attention to you? Um, less influential for do you actually get a bill? And the least and potentially not even influential at all as in uh, uh, whether the bill actually gets passed. Um, so in general, uh, people have found social movements er, uh, have their strongest effect earliest in the uh, life cycle. Um, so, right, to some, but uh, some movements can sometimes make a difference some, for some things. Um, but, so one question that, and this is where sort of this research comes in is how do these movements compare to other political actors? And so here I've been treating, and the field generally treats social movements as independent of everyone else. Um, and, and so one could ask, well, if you care about Greenpeace and are, they could be influential and they're influential more under Democratic presidents than Republican presidents, but are they more influential than like Exxon? Um, or is, for example, Planned Parenthood more important than the Pope? Uh, when it comes to influencing abortion policies, which is in the grand scheme of things what social movement scholars are potentially interested in. Who, you know, can you make a statistically significant difference is one question, um, but substantively, is your impact uh, comparable to that of other sort of central political actors? Um, how do, for example, uh, yes? Um, I'm coming back to conceptualizing actors here. Uh, so uh, actors here, right, is pretty fuzzy. Uh, but how I'm conceptualizing it, or how I end up operationalizing it is someone who has the, a person or organization that has the ability to operate quasi-autonomously um, in the political realm. Um, so it's not an event. It has to be like a, a situation or a person in the news or an organization. Yes, yeah, yeah. So here I'm specifically sort of looking at organizations um, and people. Um, and state agencies will be the sort of major characters of actors. Um, and so, right, so how does, but is a social movement as influential as, uh, this is Rand Paul, right, as influential as a sort of back of the bench senator, right? So who, who would you rather have on your team? Um, this is a question we don't know. Um, sometimes this is not quite a fair comparison. Um, so for example, would you rather have the ACLU or the Department of Justice? You would rather have the Department of Justice on your side. Um, but, but on the other hand, this isn't quite exact because the ACLU is often just trying to influence the Department of Justice. So I am sort of recognizing that these aren't always the same, you know, uh, that they are not exactly actors of the same type. Um, but that sort of, uh, so then this leads to the question of how central are social movements to uh, contemporary American politics? And so I want to look at three different types of centrality. Um, and we can think about centrality just in the news. Um, and one way to think about it is how often are you mentioned in, in uh, the newspaper? And so here, if you did an a search for the National Rifle Association, um, you would get a lot of hits, right? They're in the news prominently. Right, so this is one um, sort of measure of centrality. Um, a second measure of centrality is, um, are you mentioned with important people? Right, so when you are mentioned or sort of when you're engaged in politics, are you, with the, are you engaging with the president? Are you, uh, right, and so here, the NRA is always viewed as a blatant attempt by the Obama administration to pursue the gun control agenda through backdoor uh, rulemaking and the NRA will fight them. This is the president of the NRA talking, right? And so are you consistently involved with politics with other sort of elite players um, or are you on the sides, um, right? And so 
Animal rights activists held their noses, but not their tongues, when Mr. Richards, a member of the National Rifle Association, said that he found that puma doesn't taste like chicken and likened it to pork loin. On Thursday, the charges got more serious for Mr. Richards when a former California Democratic Party official, Kathy Bowler, filed a formal ethics complaint with the California Fair Practices Commission. Right, so here we have the same organization, and in a sort of simple count of the how many times you're in the newspaper um, would appear the same, but it's a very sort of different context. Here you're tied to sort of you're engaging with a very marginal character. Not, no offense to, to Kathy Bowler, but, but not really someone central to American politics. Um, uh, and a third way to look at sort of centrality is do others' actors' coverage usually involve you? Right, so that is, are you uniquely able to bring in other people into politics or into the news? Um, and so he, think here of the sort of like Kevin Bacon game style thing, uh, which is, right, so the thing about Kevin Bacon is that he reaches out and has been movies with lots of different kinds of people. Not that he necessarily has been in the best movies, not, or, nor the most movies, nor, uh, right, but just he's, uh, uh, the kinds of movies span and reach across different uh, genres, allowing him to connect with lots of different people. And so, and one example of this is in fact the Brady campaign to prevent gun violence, which is, uh, works on the flip side of the gun control issue, um, is almost never mentioned by themselves. They're almost always mentioned with the National Rifle Association in newspaper articles. In contrast to the National Rifle Association, which is often mentioned without the Brady people. Um, which it tells you a little something about sort of who's more important. I'm going to say here the NRA is more important, one, because they're mentioned with Obama more, uh, but two, because they are mentioned uh, because th essentially in order to get into the news, the campaign to prevent gun violence uh, has to get in through conversations with the NRA. Um, so they are potentially, so they are less central. Um, um, and so, yes. Can I ask another question? Yeah, sure. Feel, so, keep them coming. That's a very good question. And so what do you mean by how does it change? How does the... You can go back to the previous slide, right? So, so you ask in terms of the other actors coverage usually involve you. So I presume that would be a question which could also be contingent on who the actor is, right? What the operationalization of the actor is. So um, how does that... Uh, how do you analyze that? Yeah, so as I was sort of going through the, the data, the, uh, how I've been doing that is generally right at going back to my like quasi-autonomous. So if it's a person who is always listed, so I was not, so in this case, I was almost never treating Wayne LaPierre, who's in the news a lot, um, as a separate political actor um, because he's only in there in his role as the NRA. So I called him uh, part of the NRA. Um, but, but here I gave Kathy Bowler her own thing because she seemed to be acting somewhat independently um, as an own actor. So this was sort of my judgment call of my reading of the situation. And you'll see uh, sort of when I present the data that I'm uh, not finished and it's messy and that there is definitely some gray areas, particularly like Supreme Court justices maybe uh, are a problem. Uh, but so advice on how to handle those people would be appreciated actually. Um, okay, so uh, let me sort of diverge again sort of methodologically and talk a little bit methodologically about the area of sort of movements and the newspaper and sort of what's the prior research in the field. Um, and so historically when people have tried to look at these questions of how important or how central are social movements, um, they've done stuff like uh, what, oh wait, is there, did I not, oh well, I made a new slide. Oh. Well, first, sorry, here's the slide that should have came next. Um, first to say that this is a big thing that people in the social movements do. It's people who study social movements do. And the big thing is look in the newspapers. And proof here is that in about eight years ago, uh, a team of prominent social scientists, Jen Earle, Andrew Martin, John McCarthy, Sarah Sewell, wrote a piece in the Annual Review of Sociology on just the use of newspaper data in the study of collective action, another word for protest, um, which has got 246 citations, which is an, in the field of sociology an awful lot of citations. Um, and that is for a relatively small thing. It's not just like the study of all social movements, it's just the study of social movements and the news. Um, so this is, a lar this is one of the major methodologies that social movement scholars do, which is to read the newspaper. 
And so one of the, well, or not read the newspaper. And one of the ways that I don't read the newspaper um, and look previously at sort of how prominent or central social movements were um, was to make a list of about 1,400 national social movement organizations and then just count how many times they were mentioned in the New York Times. Um, and so we counted them um, for uh, across the entire 20th century here. And the most mentioned social movement organization was the American Federation of Labor Congress of Industrial Organizations, which received um, over this time period 41,000 newspaper articles. Uh, here's a, uh, in the New York Times, 33,000 in the New York Post, not New York Post, Washington Post. Uh, uh, and so let's see, over across 100 years, that would mean that they were average, that they, let's just call it 36,000. So that would mean uh, they were mentioned about 300, or they were mentioned 400 and 20 times a year, or roughly sort of every day the AFL-CIO was in the newspaper for the 20th century, which is a lot. Did, um, you, did you kind of do it over time, like when it was strong and when it was losing uh, membership and talent? Great. Yes. Oh, yeah, so we'll just jump over here. Right, and so here is, this is from a, a paper, this is an ongoing data project um, that I've been working on. Um, but so here we have tr trends in different social movements. And you can see the labor movement here, which peaked in 19 the 1930s and again in the post-World War II period um, uh, uh, with about 1,500 uh, articles in the New York Times a year, which is, right, so five times a day, or five different articles would mention the AFL-CIO, um, which is a lot, or different labor organizations. Um, uh, and looking at trends in other movements prior to that, we had the uh, rise in the veterans movements there. Uh, we have the rise of the African American civil rights movement here. And those are the sort of most popular uh, social movements in terms of news coverage uh, with their different peaks. And you know, like of interest, right, that they gum and they peak, but then they sort of like continue on, right? at in 2000, about 300 articles, so about once a day, a little less than that, there'd still be uh, the um, mentions is usually the NAACP there. Uh, let's see, other movements, uh, right? The Ku Klux Klan is big, ACLU gets a lot of coverage, anyway. Um, right, and we, we, can, we aggregated these up into their different, what we called movement families, like what types of issues are they working on, labor, civil rights, veterans, the next most uh, common was the feminist uh, slash women's rights movement, so including both like all variations of it from the suffragettes to the ERA era to the uh, contemporary era. Um, uh, the Klan, Sierra Club, uh, civil liberties, and so on. Um, uh, so this is one style of, of you know, re researching the centrality of movements here, and this is just counting how many times they get mentioned. Um, then the second style of research is to actually read the paper. Um, and so here's the most famous data set which you can download and play with yourself is called the Dynamics of Collective Action data set, um, which went through the newspaper and just charted how many collective action events, which is sort of like a protest event, um, you know, occur, were reported in the newspaper. Um, and, uh, and they also read the New York Times. Um, a common theme in uh, uh, this protest research. Um, okay, so, but that is uh, not what I did. He, well, no, actually that is, I read the New York Times. Um, but getting back to sort of my study and thinking about sort of centrality, I went, well, you know, if we're just, for now, we're just gonna cheat and assume that sort of newspaper coverage is standing in for all sorts of political influence. Um, and uh, I want to measure, one, how frequently thing people are mentioned, and two, uh, with who are they mentioned. Um, and so how would you go about this with, like, starting from scratch? Because one, I don't know who these political actors are in advance. Um, but ideally, you'd start and create a dictionary of all the people and organizations that are active in politics, um, and then use the newspapers to find out who's interacting with who, um, and then create some sort of network based on those relationships. Um, and that's um, almost what I did. 
Um, so what I did was grab all the articles from the New York Times that were published between uh, in 2009, 2010, and 2011. Um, and this is an ongoing project, so I've added the data from 2012, but it's weird to say like in nine months or whatever, eight months of 2012, and I haven't analyzed that yet. It's just sort of sitting on my hard drive. Um, and I grabbed all the um, articles that were tagged as it being a news article and so not the opinion articles um, and just from the US or Washington sections to control for um, I didn't I don't really care about international news um, and I didn't really want and I want to avoid the uh, focus on local politics right uh, that the New York Times has um, which is a flaw in both my earlier work um, and the other work here is just sort of treating the New York Times as sort of representing all, you know, uh, fairly representing all parts of the country. Um, um, and so, uh, so ideally, how we would create the list, let's do this first, create the list of political actors, one you would read in every article, um, and then every time there's a proper name uh, you would mention, add that to the list, and then evaluate that later on, potentially whether this was counting as a political actor or not. Um, and so political actors here is my specific de 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 definition is specific people, organizations, or agencies with the capacity for semi-independent political action. Um, so in practice, um, social movement organizations, which are the thing like Greenpeace or the NAACP, the thing that brought me to this. Um, but I'm also interested in think tanks, politicians, political parties, uh, federal agencies, um, which sort of political science and uh, political sociology have found can sort of operate a little bit independently of, uh, of the party in control. Um, also corporations, judges. Um, for now, I've been tossing out um, sort of more amorphous things that didn't refer to any specific entity. And so I tossed out like something like Democrats on Capitol Hill, although because I wanted to have my list of actors be mutually exclusive. And so this would include sort of both congressional Republicans, but also every single specific Republican. Um, I also so I tossed out things like environmental activists. Um, and I also tossed out dead people. Um, and and uh, uh, criminal-ish people. People brought up almost entirely in criminal context. Um, uh, so ideally, right, uh, so, and, but I, to be honest, this was just me with like no funding or anything. Um, this was a pilot project to see if I could get funding for something, and the answer is I can't, uh, but, um, Right, so I couldn't just read all these newspaper articles and circle who, uh, uh, th who the people are. Um, so then I went to the exciting world of, of uh, computer science and machine language processing. And it turns out that they have some pretty good solutions for this. Um, and it is, what I was looking for is what are called named entities in the world of computer science, which are again are like just proper nouns. Um, and it turns out that you can teach a computer to read and figure out, come pretty close to figuring out what all the proper nouns are. Um, and so what I actually did was, so I downloaded all the pages from the, actually I downloaded them from the New York Times instead of LexisNexis, because the New York Times, uh, if you ever go to the web page of the New York Times of an article, and then if you view the source of the article, so like view source and you get all the HTML code, they've coded them into different categories of like, well, what this article is about, like this is an article about taxes, or this is an article about elections. Um, and I hope to use that information later on. Uh, so anyway, so I got the data from there. Um, uh, and then I scanned all the articles to find potential proper nouns based on patterns of capitalization and part of speech. So thanks to the awesome people at Linguistics Department, Computerized Linguistics World, that there is programs that you can run put parse, that can automatically parse a sentence and tell you what's gonna be the proper noun. Um, so I uh, uh, used one program that did that, it was okay. Um, but then I ended up largely relying on patterns of capitalization to figure out where they are. The problem is you can't do this exactly um, because of words like of which in the case of the United States of America, 
means like the of is not the end of the sentence, it's part of it. Uh, but then there is other times when it's, you know, the senator uh, uh, from, right? So sometimes from will be part of the name of the organization, sometimes from will be just describing where it's from. Um, so these things are never straightforward. Um, then there's the problem of uh, linking all references to the same actor, so that President Obama is the same person as Barack Obama. Um, and these last two stages were all just done by hand. So I just sat at the list of names and was just like, oh no, that's an incomplete name, oh no, and just typed them all in and fixed them all. Um, so then I created a list of the 400 most common actors that were mentioned in the newspaper over this time period. Um, and then I just rescanned or reread each of the articles or had the computer reread each of the um, 18,000 articles looking for um, the presence or absence of the, each of these names. All right, uh, so that's what I did. So that was assumption number one of like how I went back and developed all this network was, uh, was through those methods. Um, and then so the, or the dictionary. Um, and then part two was this, the idea of interactions. And so ideally, you would have interactions between political actors be based on the actors actually interacting. Um, I can't come up with an awesome way to do that. So instead, I just count co-occurrences in the same article. So in this article, I have uh, the highlighting here is the, uh, thanks to the HTML on the uh, New York Times website, but President Benjamin Jealous of the NAACP urges Governor Nikki Haley, a Republican, blah, 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 protest by the National Association for, right, so go on and on. Um, but so I would have these two people as linked together in my data set, right? So these are people who are mentioned in the same article. In this case, I'm counting the NAACP as one political actor and Nikki Haley as the second political actor um, in the article. Um, uh, and so, yes, and we'll revisit, and you'll get to see the links in person in a second. Um, and so who was the, what, in, in the world of network analysis, these would be called edges, these links between articles. And so what individuals were, or actors were mentioned the most during this time period together? Well, George Bush and Barack Obama was number one. Uh, number two, uh, John Boehner and Barack Obama. Number three, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. Number four, Harry Reid, Barack Obama. So you can see Barack Obama is important here, in case you weren't clear, like in American news and politics. Mitt Romney, Barack Obama, right? So this covers 2008, 2009, 2010. Uh, Republican Party, Barack Obama, Rick Perry, Mitt Romney. Uh, so right, so now we're covering the, uh, getting some of the campaign news. Mitch McConnell, Barack Obama, Rick Perry, Barack Obama. Well, I never noticed that Barack Obama is in nine out of these top 10. And he is, Newt Gingrich, Barack Obama. Uh, earlier you said that you had uh, excluded Democrats on Capitol Hill, and here you have Republican Party. Yeah, that seems like a mistake. Yes. Oh. <laughs> no, it's not, though. It seems like one, but yeah, go on. Yeah, you know, looking at that now, I think I should toss that. I think that I have the like Republican National Committee, which I would count as like an independent actor, but I think the Republican Party, as used in most sort of mentions in the newspaper, doesn't refer to a sort of a specific person or, or a specific group of people like acting together in any way, in the same way that um, uh, any of the other, in the same way that the NAACP is an organization. I think it's usually just an aside. So yeah, I should probably toss that one. Um, at what point did an individual of an organization become their own entity? Like Ben Bellis and NAACP, like what would he have to do to be his own node in the network? Right, so in this one, you would have to, uh, yes, become independently well known. Right. right, independent of your organization. But like what constitutes that? Here, in this context? In yeah. I went with, with that just based on my reading of the American politics that he's only mentioned because of his role um, and so that he was the person. If he leaves the NAACP and becomes like a, sort of a freelance activist, if you will, like I would, probably, I would put like a Jesse Jackson, I would put there even though 
you, I believe he's formally still head of like Rainbow Push. So I would, um, I would count that as one thing, right? It's, right, it's, it's at the border. Um, so if, right, so we have this, so what does the overall political network look like? And so here you can actually see all 400 of the actors. If you have a computer, you can go to um, the website, but, um, uh, but you don't need one because I'll just show you one. And so here's what it looks like. And so here's the overall political network as displayed in the New York, as, 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 as to the reader of the New York Times. And so let me talk a little bit about this. The, um, each bubble is a different political actor. And the size of the bubble is how many times you were mentioned. So that sort of measure of centrality. Um, and the um, line width, which is like hard to tell, but some of these lines are thicker than others, is uh, based on how often you interact. But the better telling of how often you interact is how close you are to each other. So actors who are close to each other interact the same way. Um, then there's a, the, a sort of uh, a, another thing that I did using network techniques was that you, you can what's called cluster or find different cliques or communities. Um, each of the networks or actor, or sorry, each of the actors based on who, if there are groups that regularly interact with each other. And so that's the colors, which I'll explain that in a second. Um, so let me just uh, go through then the, right, at the center of it all is Barack Obama, who's, oh, you know what, there was not 18,000 newspaper articles, uh, was Barack Obama, who I have mentioned in 2,600-ish mentions of them, um, right, and so if we go back, sorry, out, here we had this GRED group, which sort of clustered together, can this zoom, yeah, we had that red group there, and that is in fact the Supreme Court, Right, so always, almost always mentioned together uh, with each other. Um, uh, and then we have things like the Orange Group, which is almost all people in Congress, largest of whom was John Boehner. Uh, we had the Green Group, people mentioned together, which was the Republicans running for president. Uh, we had the Federal Bureaucracy Group, um, right, which was led by the... Um, uh, Justice Department was the largest node in that there. Um, right next, so you'll notice that some of the nodes have a black ring around them. Those were the ones that I called social movement organizations. So think here, the NAACP, um, Greenpeace, in general, sort of act, uh, or the ACLU. So generally sort of membership organizations that are uh, working for political change. And so you'll note, right, so where do you find the ACLU in this graph was right next to the, so when you click on the nodes in the graph, they like get bigger, which is fun, um, but uh, makes these charts harder to see. But the one with the, and the black ring disappears. So this is me clicking on the graph and the ACLU got bigger. Um, but you can see it's right next to the Justice Department, which is A, like not surprising, but B, like reinforces the potentially the validity of this whole method that it's like, oh yes, of course the ACLU is often mentioned with the Justice Department. Um, over here we have the National Rifle Association, also in our blue engaging, engaging with the Justice Department click. Um, down here we had our Chamber of Commerce. And so there's also organizations uh, that have these red circles. Um, and those are more what I was thinking about as um, beltway interest groups. And so here think like the Chamber of Commerce, right? And so and that ends up quite close to the um, congressional uh, click over there, but still on the boundaries, but also interacting with the blue click, which is the um, Obama administration, and a little bit with the green click of the um, presidential candidates during this time period. Um, we found our Heritage Foundation over there, 36 mentions. Um, and right, so what, so, and where did I find again the, our social movement organizations that I was interested in? Primarily, they were involved in the federal bureaucracy. And so here, have here like organizations that are mentioned boom, 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 all in the blue world, and all sort of stemming just like not connected to each other very well, but just to different sort of federal agencies, right? Which goes back to, it makes sense like, well, why would you read about the Greenpeace? Potentially like they're interacting with the EPA, um, the NAACP often interacting with the Department of Justice, urging the Department of Justice to do something. Um, also in the presidential and um, in the electoral arenas. 
Um, and very few of them in the congressional community. Um, the only one that showed up, or the most prominent of that, was Planned Parenthood, um, which was frequently under attack by Republicans in Congress during this time period. Right, so it sort of makes sense that that's how they showed up over there. Um, let's uh, right. So going back to the overall sorry, question. I'm sorry. Yes. So the, if you go back. So yes. The, the dates of that. This was 2007. Eight. 2008, 9, and 10. So essentially the first three years of the Obama administration. So this is the era when there was a 62-member Tea Party caucus. Yes. Congress. And they're not showing up at all in there. They've got their own slide. Okay. All right. So oh, the Tea Party, right, so I'll jump to that because now that's interesting. So the, who's left out of this, one of the organizations totally left out of this analysis was the Tea Party because I couldn't, because reading the newspaper articles, it often, it never, it was used in place of environmental activists. So specific organizations like the Tea Party Express made it but sort of weren't mentioned that often. But general references to the Tea Party were actually quite common during this time period. Mentions of the Tea Party Caucus, I don't know that I looked at, but not that, not hugely influential. So if you add, if you do the exact same thing I did before, um, but count the Tea Party as an own sort of semi-independent organization, they are right smack dab there, which is like really influential. Right there they are, the Tea Party with 649 mentions. So to be honest, I'm not exactly sure how to handle that. So there's a, a broader sort of question that goes back to some of the actors' questions here, is that um, you sort of are presuming movements are sort of these discrete or organizations in a way. But that doesn't help us sort of figure out, to go back to your framing, a problem of somebody like Rand Paul. So Rand Paul comes out of the movement community, makes his way into right, Congress, and we might not have that visible tag anymore, but this happens all the time for the civil mm -hmm. rights movement, for union leaders, et cetera. And that doesn't seem to me, at least this method of doing this, looking at movements as discrete actors as opposed to broader biographical contexts, affiliations, et cetera, which would, I don't know how to think about that either, but I'm, I'm sort of flagging that as one of the puzzles that I've been trying to think through while I'm sitting here. Yeah, no, that makes sense to me. It's one of the ways that this is, I would definitely add that to my list of ways that this is um, uh, misrepresenting the influence of politics or misrepresenting. And in that case, it's sort of, it is downwardly biasing their influence. Right, and, and as a corollary question here, the, the issue is using this as a methodology, are you getting to at a real measure of influence or are you seeing the world through the journalist's eyes of what's influential? Yeah, the journalist size. And that's obviously going to be biased in certain particular ways of how they write about things, what they consider newsworthy, when they're going to include an organization, et cetera. I would love to just hear a little bit more about sort of how that might systematically skew these results. Right. So part of my, def my preliminary defense of, of that line of critique um, was showing how popular this method is in social movement scholarship and to say, but everyone else does it. <laughs> Um, which is a line that everyone has in their papers. It's like, but everyone else does it. Going back to potentially the most influential work in the field, um, Doug McAdams' work on political uh, process and the development of black insurgency from 82 was based on data from the New York Times. Um, and so this is, uh, this is our bread and butter. And so, um, but yes, people will mention it and attack you and you know, say, well, what, do you do? what are you getting at? One of the, what, as an additional side, it was like two weeks ago, I'm getting back to one slide here. Um, here we are. Uh, two, it was like 10 days ago, someone was like, oh, I was working with uh, uh, Edwin Amenta at, uh, at the University of Irvine um, on this project. And he said, you know, when we were working on a different paper on, on coverage in social movement organizations, um, and he said, he said, you know, I wonder if we can get something about like beat reporters. Do you think we can figure this out? And maybe that, you know, look more deep. We always like give head nods towards journalistic practices mattering. But let's see if we can nail down this beat reporter thing. And so in this data set of a couple of hundred thousand New York Times articles, we have who wrote most of, most of the articles written post 1950. Um, and then, and so 
for each of the movements, I just pulled up, well, who wrote about it a lot? And so if there was a movement where people, where there was one or two people who were writing about it a lot, I figured there was likely to be a beat for it. Um, and then looking at, but then for other papers, it, wasn't less, it was less clear. And so you could see, for example, there was looking at labor reporting, right, that there was very clearly, there was someone who had produced thousands of articles on the labor movement. This was someone who wrote, who had the labor beat for 30 years. And a quick Googling of his name revealed this to be true. Um, on the other hand, there are movements like the ACLU, which are covered by, which get enveloped into the court beat. And so that's often, uh, at least in modern times, like how they get covered, right, as opposed to the movement beat. Um, uh, and Googling around, let's see, the environmental beat formed in 1977 was potentially one of the major victories of the movement, was that when the New York Times had that. And then, which also explains, uh, so we were Googling around the guy who wrote a bunch of articles about the civil rights, uh, in the civil rights Jewish movement, movement, which is not that, you know, uh, here we have the American Jewish Congress, which is the major person, which you wouldn't necessarily expect to be the seventh most prominent, you know, thing in the news. And it turns out, and so I Googled the guy's name who wrote a mess of these stories, and the first hit was, it, wasn't, it was not the American Jewish Congress, but someone else celebrating uh, the retirement or having a dinner in honor of the retirement of the New York Times Jewish beat writer in 1964. Um, which again shows the close relationship between these social movement organizations and the beats and the practices of journalism. And that, yes, so that is a tremendous part, right? There are these other factors um, that I barely understand and have, uh, 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 don't have a lot of great measurements of. Um, but one of the ways that, well, so interestingly, just sort of on the backstory is another, let's see if we go to this one, right? We also have the, we grab comparative data from the Washington Post. So we have all the news stories from the New York Times and all the stories from the Washington Post from 1920 to 1992, which is when they drop out of the ProQuest Historical Archive. Um, and, um, uh, and, and so we wrote stories, you know, published, wrote journal articles using this data, and literally no one mentioned the Washington Post part of it. Right, so it was like we tried to say that it's not just sort of the nuances of one particular newspaper or the idiosyncrasies, like that is not driving our findings. It could be, you know, so here we've added another major newspaper and literally of the, the paper got rejected a couple times before it found a home in social forces this year. Um, not one of the reviewers said, that's great that you added the Washington Post data. So, you know, you've really sort of uh, improved your findings, uh, made it much more scientific. So at least in our field, there isn't a tremendous value uh, to adding more newspapers, too, as a way to triangulate the bias. Although I'm replicating. It's like Congress, though, right there. It's your beat. Yeah. There's a huge discrepancy between the two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, um, uh, yeah. They, uh, they get a lot of coverage. Uh, so we, um, uh, so one of the ways I'm working to do this is that I am downloading and trying to replicate or do the study, a, a better version of this study um, with the Associated Press data who publish about 224, about on the average article, average month about 2,400 articles a month. So at least, uh, so on national, news. So hopefully that will get around maybe a little bit of the problem, although I don't think it gets around a lot of it. It's still the sort of journalistic view. It's maybe more journalists, though, um, and from a less centralized location. Um, let's see. OK, so looking at the overall uh, centrality, let's go to this one, of oh, of, uh, uh, let's go to this one. The overall centrality, right, which was, and so I had sort of two, three measures of centrality. One, how often were you mentioned? Uh, two, were you mentioned with other, were you mentioned with other people who are mentioned a lot, right? So are you, do you hang out with the cool kids? And this is measured by the eigenvalue centrality is the network way, which measures, right, how, how often do you interact with other key actors? Um, the other measure of centrality that I'm interested in is between the centrality, right, which is how often do you bring in new people? How often are there people who only have access to the network 
through you, and right? And so we saw like the Department of Justice had all those organizations that only interacted with it. And so the Department of Justice would score high in that betweenness centrality. Um, and so overall, when we look at the um, measures of centrality, uh, oh, sort of overall, the um, looking at social movements, I should have this one slide, looking at social movements, the only social movement that was mentioned in the, uh, in the top 100 uh, political actors was the ACLU. Don't go by this rank, uh, which was at 179. The rest were much lower mentions. Um, and so if we look at, um, let's see, and here's a nice way that looks at it all. Um, so over here we have the eigenvalue, centrality, prestige, cool kids, right? Do you hang out with the cool kids? Between the centrality, connections, do you link other sorts of people? And the circle size is how many times you were mentioned, our, our uh, overall frequency centrality. And so the big circle way up there is President Obama, right? Scoring high, both sort of mentioned a lot, big circle, mentioned with other important people, and mentioned a lot of times with other people who are only mentioned with him. Um, and the black circles are the uh, social movement organizations, and so that one over there is the ACLU. The scale of the circles is a log scale, so even though the ACLU is one-tenth as prominent as uh, President Obama, they, um, the, the circle looks pretty close in size because otherwise it just it doesn't work. Like President Obama gets way too much news coverage. I mean, not, you know, anyway, compared to everyone else, not like as a normative statement. Um, and so, right, so the social movement organizations are here and scoring higher on this like between the centrality, right? So we can think about what does this mean? Uh, it means that, uh, that social movement organizations, particularly again, so is the ACLU, the NAACP, are still ways that bring in other actors into the news or into politics, right? And so we can think of them functioning as advocates, which is probably, which is my reading of some of these stories is how they come in, right? That someone wants to make a claim against the state, you can't do it yourself often, right? You don't, and you certainly don't make the New York Times if you just like mail an angry letter or hold a demonstration. But if you have a sort of social movement organization, uh, you're, you know, this helps you get into the news. Um, and so that's what that's showing, the sort of function of social movement organizations. Um, so other uh, major known limitations of my study, um, uh, right, so problems or potential flaws with it, the actors may not be acting or interacting, right, so a more nuanced way to look at this would say, would be to measure the different types of interactions. And so is the ACLU making claims on the, on the Department of Justice? They should do something. Um, in which case you could think about it as sort of a directed tie of one, in which case the Department of Justice should get a lot of points because other people want it to do stuff and the ACLU less. Uh, I don't quite know how to do that in practice. Um, standard caveats about newspaper data and practices of news gathering. Um, Focus on specific, I focus on specific people and downplay things like the Tea Party activists, right? When so this was the thing. Um, some actors should probably be grouped, which is just like errors in how I was going about it and realizing that this person was, you know, was really like the presidential spokesperson is really just the president, right? That's not really an independent actor. Um, so, and this is a work in progress. I'm also looking at specific issue areas. And so um, expanding my actor dictionary um, and with more times and more sources. So uh, the, let's see. And then the final, what did we learn? Um, social movements aren't very central to the contemporary political network, right? So we may think we have all these findings that say social movements are important but only the ACLU is in the top 100 for eigenvalue centrality. That is, sort of in the world of Washington politics, that outsiders are outsiders. Um, there's no cluster of social movement actors. They don't represent a cohesive community. Um, and social movement organizations are better than average at linking distant, distant, not distance actors, distant, right? Which was the, they're more on the between the centrality. So that is, in the overall, what role are they playing in national politics? It is bringing in different actors into the overall scene, which is not a horrible role to have. Um, so, oh, right. And so if you just went and you were wondering, sort of like, oh, yeah, you showed those pictures. Well, how did people compare um, on these different measures? Oh, no, that wasn't exactly it. Who has the same importance? This is what this is. And if you looked at the uh, going back to Planned Parenthood, 
they were meant they were ranked 80 they had 72 edges 72 relationships and their rank for uh, 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 they were yeah Rand Paul you'd rather have Rand Paul more at the center of politics than uh, the ACLU the EPA more at the center of politics than the ACLU uh, but roughly the same number of mentions Planned Parenthood and Rand Paul um, so what this is showing is, right, so the organizations have the exact, Rand, Planned Parenthood was similar in the overall number of mentions to Rand Paul, but Rand Paul is more central to the overall network, um, right, so more often interacting with more powerful players, which is a sort of fairly consistent finding. Um, yeah, so this is a work in progress that I'm still playing around with. So any thoughts and comments about ways to either abandon or uh, and new directions to go in or ways to improve this, um, greatly appreciated. One of the methodological, one additional methodological or issue um, is when people change. So people change organizations, organizations change, the president changes, which is a real problem. And particularly when I'm interested in categorizing individuals and organizations. So there is like Rand Paul as candidate and then he gets elected to Congress. So Rand, right, and so there are people, and there is um, uh, Evan Wolfston, who was a lawyer with Lambda Legal, and then forms an organization that's, I believe, called like Marriage Equality, but it's really just him. And so he was, a, that's the example I should have come up with before of someone who, like, at one point is tied to an organization, but then leaves it, and so, but anyway, but like then becomes their own person. Right. Which for sort of in the short time period, you can cheat and just say like the North Carolina NAACP and treat it as like one and the same, mm -hmm. which and then just know in your heart, though, that it's more nuanced than that. basically takes over the Republican Party. There's been all the recent conceptualization of parties as networks and the roles that they play in there. Thinking too of like, you know, Heaney and Rojas's work on, on the party in the street. But basically breaking down those conceptual boundaries of what a movement is, when a movement acts as part of a party, when it doesn't, and that general sense of hybridity. And I, I keep getting hung up in that, I guess, because I love the data set. I, I, I think it, it's, amazing um, and it shows us so much about visibility at least um, but I'm still having a hard time making that leap from that visibility to influence in some ways I mean I guess we can infer it in some ways but knowing what we know from a lot of other related literatures it seems difficult to make that jump to say that because you know the Planned Parenthood is you know not set, you know not necessarily in the top 100 that they're not central to a party network when they absolutely would be I think Yeah, there is, right, so then the other, um, no, 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 I agree with you that the, it could be that the whole hook is wrong um, and that it's not, right, because it is studying visibility, that's yeah. sort of true, uh, right, and because the other way is you think about what's the, I forget what it stands for, like ALEC, A-L-E-C, the sort of 
right, right wing think tank organization, which it turned out, right, which was sort of revealed after the um, shooting death in, uh, in Florida, right, it turned out that there was this secret organization that had been, you know, drafting legislation for all these different states. And it turned out they were importantly, like tremendously influential, and you had never heard of them, right? You always hear of the Brookings Institute or whatever, but there's all these other think tanks that are way more influential, like, uh, uh, but less. Um, visible, right. right? So I kind of I, I'm s somewhat sympathetic to that. It's still an outcome, um, though, visible, right? right. Mean, oh yeah, yes, yes. It's still an outcome, so you can still frame it within that. It's just that, that notion of the influence. Is, uh, yeah. that, oh. Right. Yeah. No. No. That. That. Thank you. That's. Uh, this is building up well, well together. Right. Because there's this question of right. Are they dis right? Because this is right. Are they being portrayed as marginal? Right. So they're always just interacting with random persons or something like that. Right. So I guess that's the betweenness centrality shows their marginalness to the thing that they're always hanging out with the losers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No. Then. Yeah. Right. Because it would be why would a reporter if you're not making claims against someone like someone should do something someone should fix it and sort of one of the findings in social movement literature is people without a sort of prognostic frame or or, or well either any sort of frame that is if you can't find someone who's responsible for the problem who's more powerful or someone who could fix the problem this is bad for you you are likely to sort of fail as a movement um, and this makes sense the sort of journalistic aspect of it uh, is similar sort of if you can't there's no news there if you can't um, link it to someone who actually matters No. So the other, um, uh, so I, after sort of, I'd been pretty far along in this, I figured, I learned that there was um, 
uh, a sociologist the name of David Noak, who had done some studies of policy networks um, in the 1980s, 70s, and 80s. Um, and his work was went and talked to people in an area. Um, so like who's involved in, I think it was four different domains, uh, but like who does, who's involved in healthcare politics? And then they went and interviewed people who were lobbyists in healthcare politics, and they asked them, A, who do you think is influential, but also B, who do you interact with? Right? Who do you trade knowledge with um, to get this other, this, uh, uh, the sort of more behind the scenes or actual networks as opposed to the perceived or visible networks? Um, so yeah, there's definitely uh, uh, need to draw more on these um, sort of other conceptions of networks and policy actors. How are you mining all the data? So mining, like, so um, the original mining of all the New York Times websites, I don't know, it is just done um, on, it was originally done in a Stata, a computer language program. Um, which is not made for it, but you can access the internet. And so it just downloads it. And then they are text files. And you essentially are just searching for patterns. Um, and so the New York Times is a little bit of a pain. But in general, there's like a code that's like article begins here, article ends here. And so I just cut all the stuff before it says article begins and then d and get rid of all the stuff that says article ends. Do you also do searches based on keywords or something like that? So do you say, OK, I want to try and find well, so for this one and for my AP stuff, I've just been ga for gathering the data set myself of all stories. So I sit, so LexisNexis allows you to do searches which return up to 3,000 results and download them in batches of a 500. So which is why it's very nice that the, the AP produces about 2,400 political or domestic news stories a, a month because then you can download, you can search for from the beginning of the month to the end of the month, and then you can download it. And it takes a couple of minutes of boredom, but you know, you can sit and click, and then it like takes a minute to think, and then it downloads all the articles. And you can do, a, if you're doing that for the, well, for the example of the Associated Press and limit by section, you don't have to search for a specific keyword, right? So you can do essentially a blank search. And similarly on the New York Times, you can give a blank search, and it will return um, lots and lots of hits. Um, and so I've just been downloading all of them. And then later on, when I want to pull articles about, like go back and like look at one specific, you know, how often does um, like same-sex marriage occur, um, pull those based on my own data set of things rather than hitting up the LexisNexis again. There is, I mean, uh, I don't know whether this would be directly relevant, but I see some ways in which you can utilize this. Uh, there's a software available, um, um, uh, but it's for free. Uh, this was developed by one of the uh, former students now an assistant professor at Rutgers. It's called Context Minor. Context Minor. Um, so I think that's something that you might find to be useful as, you know, as you think about your applications in this world. Yeah, once you have all like sort of all the articles, there's a lot of fun stuff to do with it, um, which I'm just sort of beginning to capture. Um, there is like professional um, professionals that will, professional web services that will do some of the like named entity extraction. And yes, and some of them do it better.